Tonight, the deadly storms that delivered damaging winds, power outages, and scenes of panic. Devastation. Absolute devastation. Emergency alerts played a part. How did they work? Also tonight, a pandemic-long battle to get paid back for canceled flights. How can somebody use my money without my consent? And my conversation with Canada's Olympic chef de mission, Bernie Surin. It's only up to you. Work hard and don't forget, my son, never cheat in life. Still holding his mother's message, still holding a Canadian record. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. At least eight people were killed and tens of thousands are still without power after Saturday's storm system ripped across parts of Ontario and Quebec. Extreme winds toppled trees and caused extensive damage to power lines and homes. An emergency alert prompted many, relaxing on a holiday weekend, to take shelter with just minutes to spare. The storm started in the morning, then moved quickly across a highly populated area of the country. Its path extended more than 1,000 kilometers from Windsor to Quebec City. In its wake, destruction. North of Toronto, the town of Uxbridge has declared a state of emergency. Greg Ross spoke to shaken residents about what it was like as they assessed the damage. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Melissa Hancock took this cell phone video from her apartment as the storm passed through Uxbridge, Ontario. I don't know what's happening. This is Oh my God. She says the storm caught her by surprise. It literally thinking the world is coming to an end. Part of the roof of her apartment building was ripped off. The surrounding streets littered with debris and fallen trees. That was the window there. Today, Hancock and her husband were allowed back into their apartment briefly to gather some of their belongings. Get the essentials and get out. Her everything is covered in shards of glass. Ashley Woodhams had to cut a long weekend vacation short after a neighbor called to tell her that her house was destroyed in the storm. Luckily, uh, nobody was in the house. Today, she returned to try and salvage what she could. We took out our memories. We're gathering some clothes and that's all we have. There were scenes like this everywhere here. Hundreds of homes, buildings and cars were damaged, many by fallen trees. The storm ripped this tree right out of the ground, even taking a chunk of the curb with it before landing on top of this house. Residents here tell me that both the tree and house are more than 100 years old. And now it's just gone. This man lives across the street from this house. He says, fortunately, his neighbor wasn't home at the time of the storm. You almost have to feel a little fortunate that you're yeah. still standing yeah, over Yeah, I feel pretty lucky. Trees also took out power lines, leaving most of the township in the dark, and many may have to wait a long time before they have power again. Much of our hydro infrastructure is gone, um, and we had crews working all last night, and we expect that they'll be working around the clock to get us connected, but it, it could be days, weeks, I'm not really sure. Uxbridge Mayor Dave Barton says he's lived here his whole life. We, we've never had a storm like this come through, through town before, and the devastation is just horrible, right? Yeah. Uh, we have, we have uh, many people displaced, both in single-family homes and then multi-residential. He says it could take weeks before they know the full extent of the damage and much longer to rebuild. But he says there is a silver lining. Because when you look at some of the buildings, it's, it's amazing that, that everybody survived and there weren't any significant injuries. Greg Ross, CBC News, Uxbridge, Ontario. Many people are still without power in the Ottawa area as well, where the cleanup is expected to go on for days. As Rafi Bujikanian explains, the powerful storm was also a test of the emergency alert system designed for extreme weather threats. Jane Griffith's home lost power, but things could have been much worse. She was napping when the storm started. Right there, right where the, that window is. So that's really close. Yes. <laughs> yeah, very lucky. Well, you see where the break came. It could have just easily been there. But she's used to hurricanes from her time living in the U.S., but Griffith says she's also used to a bit more of a heads up. There we always had like long warnings. <laughs> you could evacuate days ahead of time. Residents here received an emergency warning on mobile phones at 3.18 in the afternoon, asking people to seek shelter. 
Earlier, it had gone out to other areas as the storm approached them. Put into place in 2018, it's controlled by Environment Canada and comes with this noise. More commonly associated with Amber Alerts. I heard sound, I really thought probably another young kid's missing or like this kind of message. Minutes later, the wind and rain battered the Ottawa area. The nearby city of Clarence Rockland has declared a state of emergency, asking people to stay home due to the amount of debris. In Ottawa, officials have opened up community centres to help residents charge their phones and appliances while electricity is still out. The number one priority is to get the, the roads clear uh, and to get people's hydro back as quickly as possible uh, and to do it in a safe fashion because obviously with uh, trees coming down and live wires we want people to be very very careful. An effort that could still take several days, the city warns, asking people for patience. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Those who track the weather say what hit Ontario and Quebec yesterday was unusual and not just because of that destructive power. CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is here to explain why. Johanna? Ian, what we saw yesterday was a fairly rare type of thunderstorm called a derecho. I think I've only tracked about a handful of these myself. They're long-lived windstorms with an official definition of a swath of damage about 400 kilometers wide. This one was about 600 kilometers wide. Yesterday's 1,000 kilometer trail began in Illinois. What we watch for on the radar is what's called a bow echo. So a cluster of thunderstorms evolves into a single strong storm with a distinctive curve in the middle. Its downdrafts hit the ground, then race out in front of the storm. These derechos can produce wind gusts at the same speed of tornadoes, the difference being the damage is all in one direction rather than in a rotating pattern. We call these straight line winds. New air replaces the winds that race out ahead, so the storm basically maintains itself. Derechos need a very hot and humid environment with strong winds higher up in the atmosphere, all conditions in place across Ontario and Quebec last night, but they are notoriously hard to predict. It's really not until we see that bow in the radar that we know when is even happening. Ian? Thanks, Johanna. In Alberta, an entirely different kind of cleanup was underway today. This morning, 43 train cars derailed near Fort McLeod in the southern part of the province. They were carrying potash. The RCMP says uh, there were no injuries and there's no risk to the public. CP Rail says the cause of this derailment is under investigation. Globally, the number of monkeypox cases continues to grow as experts try to track its path. And as Valeria Corey Minocchio explains, concern in this country has now spread beyond Montreal. Toronto is investigating its first suspected monkeypox case. The patient is a man in his 40s who was in contact with someone who traveled to Montreal. In that city, multiple cases have already been confirmed. More are being investigated. This clinic treated some of them. Most of them, they present with flu-like symptoms. So um, sometimes it's a fatigue, sometimes fever, chills, muscle pain. The symptoms, they last for about two or three days, four days, and then they go away. At the same time, they have eruptions that appear. Montreal Public Health says most of the cases have been mild and it's urging people not to panic, even though the situation is unusual. It is an increase in the number of cases above what we are used to, since we're used to zero. At least 15 countries have confirmed cases, with Israel and Switzerland among the latest. Dr. Vin says educating the public is key. We can trace it back to certain types of either C c communal activities or a communal site and so that's how we can do targeted education by saying that if you uh, believe that you were in proximity or in direct contact with a confirmed or suspected case or in this site or that location uh, then you need to monitor for a b and c you need to inform your public health authority earlier this week montreal public health said cases had so far been identified mainly among men aged 30 to 55 who have had sexual contact with other men but everyone is susceptible. Monkeypox is not sexually transmitted. It can spread in a number of ways, including through open sores, close contact, and respiratory droplets. But advocates worry about stigmatizing the LGBTQ community. It stops people from wanting to go get tested. It stops people from uh, wanting to talk to the people who they might have exposed so they can get tested. Montreal Public Health says there will be an update early next week. 
Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal. The maker of Jif brand peanut butters issued a voluntary recall of some of its products due to possible salmonella contamination. It is urging retailers to pull 11 types of peanut butter from shelves and for Canadian consumers to check the serial numbers of their jars against those listed in the recall. This comes after 14 people fell ill in the United States. And some welcome news for some of the U.S. parents scrambling to figure out how to feed their babies. A military plane full of infant formula from Europe landed today. It's meant to alleviate a shortage that's been dragging on for weeks. But as Katie Simpson shows us, it'll take a lot more to solve this problem. Off to your left. Put it off to your left. A plane load of relief. The first shipment of European-produced hypoallergenic baby formula departs Germany for the United States. There's enough on board to feed 9,000 babies and 18,000 toddlers for a week. This particular uh, shipment is going to be distributed immediately to hospitals and clinics uh, around the country. This is just a Band-Aid solution to a gaping wound of a problem. To fill store shelves, far more shipments are needed as U.S. domestic production remains stalled. It's going to take some time to get us in more of a routine and back to what we what we like to hope for our families as a kind of a normal feeling. The crisis is largely due to a recall and shutdown of the Abbott production facility in Michigan after the discovery of bacteria. In an op-ed published in the Washington Post, the chairman of Abbott says he expects to restart the facility by the first week in June, and it will take six to eight weeks before product is available on shelves. He also apologized, writing, I have high expectations of this company, and we fell short of them. Stories of families desperately searching for formula are growing more common and urgent. Children in at least three different states have been hospitalized because of reactions to new or homemade formula. Look, it's a reasonable question. A top economic advisor in the White House was pressed on CNN to explain how this could even happen in the U.S. He first blamed Abbott, then lamented the fact three companies control 90 percent of the formula market. How we can bring more competition in our economy, have more providers of this formula so that no individual company has this much control over supply chains. Another military cargo plane full of formula will arrive in D.C. this week, with even more flights to come, according to the White House. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. As the U.S. military ships baby formula into the country, the U.S. president is on a diplomatic mission to Asia. He arrived in Japan, where he's expected to meet with the Japanese president and leaders of India and Australia, a loose alliance known as the Quad. Let's turn to Ukraine now. Russian forces are closing in on the city of Severodonetsk, setting the stage for a battle over the city. This as the Ukrainian president acknowledged the toll of the war. Volodymyr Zelensky said 50 to 100 soldiers may be dying every day. A tragedy marked by mourners in Kyiv. This woman lost her son. 37 men were with him, she says, 37 friends, and no one came back. Both Ukraine and Russia have posted propaganda, but reports suggest Russia is gaining ground, striking targets south of Severodonetsk, like this university building in nearby Bakhmut and destroying a bridge that links the city up with Ukrainian reinforcements. This scene is from near the front lines, a snapshot of the danger facing Ukrainian forces. Ukrainian officials have ruled out any territorial concessions to Moscow, but Russia seems to be consolidating its control over Ukraine south, including control over the information that gets out. Prior Stewart is not far from that region and spoke to some who escaped and some still trapped. At this evacuation center, finally some free moments to play. This family fled their village in Kherson Oblast on Friday, crossing the front line by bicycle. We decided to take bicycles so we could see better what was under our feet, this man says. Sitting in the car, you can't see landmines. Many have made the precarious trip out in the past three months. Kherson lies just north of Crimea. 
It was one of the first places to fall to Russia in the early days of the invasion. The country's military is keen to show its soldiers demining communities and handing out food aid. But these are some of the images that circulate on social media. Residents protesting the Russian occupation. In one word, it's hell, this woman says. She constantly feared that her husband could be stopped by Russian soldiers and taken away at any moment. The mayor of Klivichy, a city north of Kherson, says tens of thousands have escaped over the front lines and many others are still waiting for their chance. It's not easy to escape, he says. There were two incidents when grad rockets were shot at a peaceful convoy and people died. CBC News has not been able to confirm those details and it's hard to get a clear picture of what's happening in areas under Russian control. People who have fled Kherson have talked about their cell phones being searched and seized by Russian soldiers. There have been reports of kidnappings and of people disappearing, which is why those still living in the occupied areas are terrified of speaking publicly. We cannot say anything what Russia not like. And this is really dangerous. This woman who wanted to remain anonymous says soldiers frequently ask residents what they think of the Russians being there and there are consequences if you don't say the right thing. If we say you occupied us, soldier not happy, and they say straight, you like I shoot you, you like I shoot all your family. Some from Kherson speak of widespread food and medicine shortages. That was a big worry for Helena Harchenko's family. They're now staying temporarily at a school along with other families who have fled. The hardest thing was that the electricity was turned off and gas was destroyed. We could not walk to get firewood, so we took pieces of our barn to cook food. She's six months pregnant, so her priority now is to see a doctor and, like others here, give her family a welcome reprieve before figuring out just where they'll go next. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Klevichy, Ukraine. Australian voters chose a Labour government on the weekend, ending nine years of Conservative rule. The new Prime Minister will attend his first international meeting on Monday in Tokyo. It enables us to send a message to the world. There is a change of government. Uh, there will be some changes in policy, particularly with regard to climate change and our engagement uh, with the world uh, on those issues. Votes are still being counted, so it's not yet clear whether Anthony Albanese will head a majority government or a minority. A wave of independent candidates focused on climate change had a big impact. <laughs> Afghanistan's Taliban leaders are now requiring all female TV anchors to cover their faces while on air. The order went out last week, but most news outlets didn't comply until today. At one station, men also anchored with masks in a show of solidarity with their colleagues. The Taliban has recently made a sharp pivot in how it treats women, imposing more and more restrictions reminiscent of the group's rule in the late 1990s. At least 57 people are dead after days of flooding and landslides in parts of Bangladesh and northeastern India. Millions more face hardship. The two countries are prone to flooding, but this is some of the worst they've ever seen. As Georgie Smythe tells us, this is all before monsoon season even begins. Children paddle a makeshift raft in the flooded waters of northeastern India. This is the reality for people still trying to live in their homes despite the worst flooding in remote areas of India and Bangladesh in nearly two decades. Many millions are displaced after torrential rains submerged swaths of farmland and damaged the homes of some of the desperately poor. This man says he managed to escape with only a few pieces of clothing. Everything else was destroyed. Another says boats are the only way to get around and they're running out of drinking water. Dozens have been killed in this region during days of pre-monsoon flooding, landslides and thunderstorms.
Many parts of Bangladesh and neighbouring regions in India are prone to flooding, but that season doesn't usually start till June. It's a concern for experts there looking at ways to adapt to the changing climate. We are receiving this amount of uh, rainfall and runoff. We don't know what's going to ha happen in this uh, uh, monsoon season. Bangladesh, India and their neighbours have already sweltered through an extreme heat wave this year. Scientists say climate change is increasing the likelihood of extreme weather events around the world and the world's most vulnerable will bear the brunt. Bangladesh is really not ready because the one cyclone caused more than a billion dollars of damage and last five years we saw many, many cyclones and many, many floods is coming. So. Uh, the, this challenge needs adaptation funding for the country and uh, additional support. For now, though, the priority is saving what can be salvaged, drying harvests to be sold and carrying belongings to higher ground to keep living against the tide of climate change. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. A mother is searching for answers after her son died in police custody. No one can prepare you for when your son is dying. We investigate how a routine traffic stop ended in a deadly confrontation. To listen to him get beat to death was, it was hard. An Ontario couple is speaking out against a travel agency after a battle to claim their airline voucher. How can somebody use my money without my consent? Why there's so little recourse for travelers. You have to be buyer beware. And an act of kindness caught on video. It seemed like a, a very beautiful moment of people coming together in the community. We're back after this. CBC News, The National, named Canada's best national newscast at the Canadian Screen Awards. Thousands of travelers are still facing challenges trying to use vouchers they received when airlines cancel flights during the pandemic. It can mean hours on the phone bouncing from airline to travel agency. Well, tonight, one man goes public with his fight for more than $5,000. Erica Johnson shows us how an agency used his vouchers to book trips for other people. When Surinder Paul Gill and his wife bought nine tickets for a family trip to India, they thought they were in good hands with their local travel agency. My wife was trying to find out the best tea that we could get. And then uh, uh, his deal was a little bit better than the other ones available. But once in India, the pandemic hits. Air Canada cancels their return tickets. They pay to take an emergency government flight home. For the next year and a half, Gill waits for the $5,200 worth of travel vouchers Air Canada owes him. But each time he calls his travel agency, they tell him no vouchers exist. When he finally gets them directly from the airline... So that shows zero. That shows zero, yeah? No amount at all. No amount, at fully used. $5,200 basically drained. His travel agency has used the vouchers for other people. I feel like I have been betrayed, surprised, and also my money. How can somebody use my money without my consent? He files a complaint with the regulator for travel agencies in Ontario. It opens an investigation. The voucher is intended for the consumer who made the original uh, booking and, and, and payment. And um, so the scenario that's been described um, seems un unusual. The regulator can penalize individual travel agencies, but lacks the power to force them to compensate the customer. And then there are consumer complaints about fees travel agencies are charging to release those vouchers. Their attempt to recoup the commission they lost when flights got cancelled. Anywhere from $75 to over $200 per ticket. And the travel agencies are free to charge whatever they want. There's nobody overseeing it, and you have to be buyer beware. All Link declined a request for an interview, promised to send a statement, but never did. After GoPublic got involved, though, the travel agency sent its customer an e-transfer for the $5,200 it had spent. It also claimed the whole thing was a mistake. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. After the break, we revisit one of Canada's greatest moments in sport. Rooney Surin has the lead. He's going to hand off in front.
confronted would appear to Donovan Bailey. A gold medal that surprised the world in 1996. On the team, Bruni Surin will be mentoring the next generation of athletes. My slogan is go get it. My conversation with Team Canada's new chef de mission is next. Welcome back. Tonight we want to find out more about Canada's chef de mission for the 2024 Olympics in Paris. Bruni Surin is one of this country's greatest athletes who became a star on a hot summer night 26 years ago. Bruni Surin has the lead. He's going to hand off in front of what appeared to Donovan Bailey. It's going to be double gold Canada. Oh, if you're Canadian, you have to love Saturday nights in Georgia. Surin was a member of the 4x100 relay team that won at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, part of this country's golden age of sprinting. I sat down with him this week to talk about Olympic greatness, past and present. Bruni, it's a real pleasure to have you on the program. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk about your role as chef de mission in just a moment, but I think it's important to remind Canadians that you are one of the fastest men ever in the 100 meters, and you were part of really a golden age in track and field in the late 80s, early 90s. What was your favorite moment as a sprinter? Uh, I have two favorite moments. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, we won, we as a Canadian won the Olympic Games in 1996 and the 4x1 relay. I mean, uh, when you look at the race, I mean, it wasn't only uh, five guys uh, as a team uh, who, who won that medal. I mean, even today, 25 years uh, later, uh, people in Canada still talking uh, to me about saying, I remember when we won, not when you guys won, when we as Canadians won the 96, they remember where they were and everything. And I feel I feel very uh, fortunate. I feel very, uh, I'm saying that with uh, all humility, uh, being part of, uh, of that sport history in Canada. And can you imagine uh, five guys together we were so close, and that's what made the difference uh, that we won the gold medal. Because if you look at on the, on paper, we were not the favorite. But what I'm saying is when you have this uh, camaraderie, the trusting in each other, the good communication, you can make miracles. And, of course, my second uh, best uh, part of my career was uh, when I ran uh, 9.84 seconds uh, over the distance of 100 meters uh, when I at 32 years old. And when I look at that, I mean, that was, uh, that was my ultimate goal. Uh, my ultimate goal when I was 17 years old as a young kid, I was uh, looking at the uh, Olympic Games. My idol was uh, Carl Lewis, and I wanted to run faster than him. Uh, whereas a lot of people were laughing at me, they thought that he was uh, impossible. But with persever perseverance, with uh, hard work, after 15 years, I realized that. I mean, those two moments are going to stay with me for forever. Yeah, in mm. that personal time, it should be pointed out, you and Donovan Bailey had that as your best time, and it is still, after all these years, mm -hmm. the Canadian record. So that was an extraordinary time in the 100 metres. But let's go back yeah. to that moment in Atlanta. I, I was a reporter for CBC in Atlanta at that moment, and you're right. It was a moment where many of us as Canadians mm. remember exactly where we were. I, I want to ask you about a moment on the tape where you finished your third leg. Now, there you are with the yeah. eyes of the world on you. you. Your team still has the anchor leg to go, but you shot your fist up in triumph. What were you thinking at that moment? We were in lane number six. So the USA was in the inside lane. So when I was running on the, on the bend, I didn't see anybody besides me. So when I finished the bend and I just gave the baton uh, to Donovan and I saw the U.S. team wasn't there. So to me, it was, we are winning, we are ahead. So that's why as soon as I gave the, the, the baton to Donovan, I just knew, I just raised my arm. <laughs> and I was so motivated, I was so happy. I kept, I kept I kept running, I kept running after Donovan. And we were like, we get the gold medal, we get the gold medal. So that was, that was a, so exciting. That's a, that was a great, great moment. <laughs> it is one of the greatest moments in Canadian sport. It is on YouTube in its entirety. And if people haven't seen it or haven't seen it lately, I highly recommend they take a look at it. There's so much we could talk about with that 4x100 team. But one of them is the, the four of you who were running in that final, all four of you were the pride of Canada, but you also all were born in other countries and your mm -hmm. families came to Canada. Um, I think, you know, we see that out a lot in track and field in Canada. What do you think that says about this country? To me, what, what he said, he said that this country uh, offer 
uh, great opportunity. Actually, matter of fact, this country offers all the opportunity because I still remember I came to Canada at seven years old and uh, my mom came one year uh, before me. My parents came one year before me. And after one year, I didn't see my mom, then in Montreal. And one of the first things she, she told me, she said, here, you have all the opportunity. It's only up to you work hard and don't forget my son never cheat in life so that was the lesson so to me my mindset when i grow up is like okay here i'm gonna have all the opportunity i'm gonna work hard i'm never gonna cheat and i'm gonna succeed that was my mindset and that's what the the the, the country offered me but you have to go seize it so that's the same message i said to especially the younger generation to the kids i say kids you need to work hard uh you have your dream go for it and my, my slogan is go get it every time i say that go get it go get it that's that, that, that to me it's just simple yes. but work hard you yeah. know, i mean it's so inspiring and and you you managed to live it to its ultimate but let's now talk about your role as the chef de mission a whole new mm. generation of young athletes many of whom were probably born in other parts of the world and have come to Canada, many of whom are born in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they're a whole different generation, Bruni. I hear this when I watch hockey, when I hear people yeah. talk about their businesses. How, how much of a challenge is it to be a chef de mission to athletes who have grown up in entirely an entirely different generation? When I retired back in 2002, I always said to myself, I want to uh, transfer uh, the knowledge because I was in an athletics high level for 18 years. So in my mind, I said, okay, I want to 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 give it back to the younger generation. And matter of fact, I've been talking to the Canadian Olympic Committee for almost uh, 12 years now of my intention. So it was a long process, but with perseverance. When they told me that, uh, okay, well, for 2000 for 2024, it's gonna be it's gonna be me, the chef de mission. I was just jumping in there. I was so happy and. The good things about it is it's two years before the games. So I want to go in the competition. I want to know about the athletes. I'm telling all the athletes that I'm here for you. If you need me, if you need advice, I'm here for you anytime. And uh, once I get to 2024, the message also I'm, I'm sending to all the athletes, don't ever forget the fun part. You need to have fun. Yes, it's serious. Yes, there's going to be pressure, but never forget about the fun part. You need to have fun in what uh, what you do. The passion has to be there. One last thing I should say. I mean, there are a lot of talented Canadians who are going to go to the next Olympics, but one of them mm. is probably head and shoulders above the rest when it comes to track and field. Andre de Grasse, you must watch his career with pride yeah. and wonder. Oh, yeah, I'm very proud of uh, Andre. I remember I've, I've been, well, I saw him the first time in 2015 where I went to the Canadian Championship and we saw each other. I gave him a hug and I kept I kept closing my arms. And when I stepped back, I said, oh, my God, you're so small. <laughs> you know, we, 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 I'm like, how how, 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 you, how you do it? And we exchange. We have a, we have a talk. I know that he's very strong uh, psychologically. And matter of fact, the last Olympic in, uh, in uh, Tokyo, I went to see him after his bronze me medal in the 100 meters. And we were jo just joking around. And at the end, he said, well, thank you, Bruni. But, hey, you still have the record, eh? <laughs> we started <laughs> we start laughing. I said, hey, listen, I want you to have that record. I said openly from five years ago that you were supposed to do it. So what are you waiting for, you know? <laughs> well, he'll so have, yes, it's going to be special. <laughs> he'll have another chance to, to break it. But yes, yeah, uh, we yeah. should say for the record, you and Donovan still have the record. Bruni, a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I should say, as soon as I said that DeGrasse is head and shoulders above other Canadians in the athletics portion of the Olympics, that's among sprinters, right? There's a young man, Damian Warner, who won gold in the decathlon, and he is literally, and I think figuratively as well, head and shoulders above uh, other Canadian athletes right now. But what a fun interview that was. Uh, next on The National, now, an Alberta man died in police custody after getting stopped for a broken taillight. We can just hear him piling on him. Um saying, please help me. We investigate the confrontation that ended his life. Next. Welcome back. Edmonton police picked up Daniel Robinson after a routine traffic stop for a broken brake light. After one night in custody, he emerged with fatal injuries. His mother's been fighting for answers ever since. And tonight, as Jorge Barrera shows us, she now has details that call into question the version of events that she'd been told before. When 
Danny entered a room, you knew he was there. His goal was always to make other people laugh. I've been talking to Marilyn Hayward for the past five months about her son. She wants to find out the truth about how he died. He was a good man in so many ways. This is where it all started to end for Danny. He was stopped by the police right here at this spot. It was a routine stop over a burnt out brake light less than a block from his home when police ran his name. It was flagged for an unpaid fine for driving without insurance in 2019. He was arrested and taken to the Edmonton Remand Centre. In messages to his mother from the back of the cruiser, he said it was just the normal process for people who don't pay this type of fine and sent a photo of the jail's bay door. I promised him somehow or other we would get this fine paid and uh, it got paid at three o'clock the next day. Danny was supposed to be set free that night. Hours passed. Marilyn waited and worried. She called the jail. No one answered. In the morning, a correctional officer picked up with information that shocked her. Danny was in the hospital. I asked him what happened. And he says, I'm going to read to you from the logbook. At the time of release, Danny got confrontational because he refused to wear a mask. And it took, I'm sure they said four, four men to restrain him. When Marilyn and Danny's two brothers arrived at the hospital, they found him unconscious a ventilator keeping him alive. Danny, we're here, bro. We'll figure this out. An audio recording by one of Danny's brothers captured the family's shock, horror, and confusion over his wounds. This is even worse than I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. The eye is black and swollen. His whole fucking side of his face is swollen. Days after he was jailed for not paying a fine, Danny was taken off life support. No one can prepare you to watch. No one can prepare you for when your son is dying. It's not something you will ever forget. It's not, you'll never unfeel it. The Edmonton Police is responsible for investigating deaths at the Remand Centre, but a week after Danny's death, the family received a call with news they couldn't believe. I'm with the Edmonton Police Service. Okay. Um, I'm one of these uh, staff sergeants. The death is not considered criminal. So you're saying that there's, there's going to be no charges laid? Not from EPS. There won't be any criminal charges. The first thought was they don't think Danny's worth anything. They're not even to investigate. Danny's death didn't matter. Still searching for answers, Marilyn requested and received Danny's hospital records. The documents describe parts of his final moments. During a physical dispute with guards, he was pepper sprayed, sedated with injection, suffered cardiac arrest. It took 20 minutes to restart his heart. Blood at the scene. The damage that that does. The violent scene still haunts psyche, an eyewitness um, like who agreed to speak to hear, with CBC like, News. You know, to listen to him get beat to death was, it was hard, yeah. It was never over a mask. Michael Claussen stood next to Danny in line as they waited that evening, moments away from being released. He says the altercation was started by a guard. The guard starts hitting him and then, like, all you can hear is, like, quit resisting, um, like, put your hands behind your back. Claussen says he and other inmates were herded into a cell out of the way. He saw other guards swarm Danny. We can just hear him piling on him, um, saying, please help me. And then it turns into, please help me, I can't breathe. Please help me breathe, I can't breathe. And then he just goes quiet after he says, I can't breathe. Yeah, did the Edmonton police uh, reach out to you at all? No, not at all. But a major piece of information was still missing. 
an official record of how and why Danny died. So I'm on the way to see Marilyn. She's finally received the final autopsy report in the mail. She's been waiting for it for a long time and she's hoping it will give her some straight answers. When this came in the mail, I didn't even want to open it for a while. I really didn't. And uh, so that I knew I had to. The autopsy report said the way jail guards restrained Danny led to his fatal brain injury. It happened as he lay on the floor in a prone position, his hands cuffed behind his back with guards using force to subdue him. His heart stopped and then his brain starved from reduced flow of blood and oxygen. The conclusion, accidental death. The beating was no accident. To say accidental death is taking everything, is, is taking responsibility away from who needs to be responsible for this. The conclusion more aptly would have been it was a homicide because it was human action that caused the death. Engel says Edmonton police often fall short investigating cases involving inmate victims of guards. That is just infuriating that the police would say, well, you know, the medical examiner says uh, accidental death, our job is done. That's uh, abdication of responsibility. Edmonton police declined our interview request, but we still had questions about Danny's death. I'm a reporter with CBC News, and I'm here to speak to someone about the death of Daniel Robinson. Stop, Sergeant. Have to go through public relations, media relations. In an emailed statement, police said they did a thorough investigation. As for the guards involved, the Solicitor General of Alberta, which oversees the remand center, declined to tell CBC News whether any of the guards faced disciplinary action. But Marilyn says she's not done the fight. She hired a top civil lawyer to file a lawsuit. To this day, nobody has ever phoned me from the Edmonton Remand Center. No one has phoned me to say, sorry, your son died while he was here. Nobody. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Edmonton. Well, coming up, a change of pace, some good news that came out of yesterday's treacherous storm. I felt like this is a, a community I want to be a part of. Up next, the moment a group of strangers banded together. Yesterday's storm in Ontario came in fast and hard, and it caught a lot of people by surprise, leaving some in danger. The winds were so strong it knocked people off their feet, including one elder trying to cross a street in Mississauga, Ontario. But some people stepped in, and their kindness is our moment. My two daughters and I heard the um, thunderstorm, and it suddenly started clouding, and we were looking from the window to watch what's happening, and we noticed a group of people uh, bending down on someone who is obviously has fallen. On, um, on the floor. When I took a good look, it was an elderly person. People started coming together to try to pick that person up and help them cross the road. And it was hard because of how, how windy it was. I was concerned, but then um, when I saw people coming together, I felt like they were in good hands. And I also noticed how genuinely concerned everybody was. I was very touched. I was worried for the senior person. I felt like um, she, she, she or they were related to me in a way because we all have senior people and we always imagine them in a difficult situation. And we hope that when they are in difficult situations, they can get the help that they need at that moment. I felt like this is a community I want to be a part of. And I'm really, uh, I applaud those people. They were uh, actually great. I love that line. I felt like this is a community I want to be part of. It's kind of the community equivalent of the golden rule. And as she points out, you would hope that those, the people we know who are vulnerable would be cared for by even strangers on the road as happened there. That is The National for May 22nd. Thanks for watching. Good night.